Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted uh, to be able to speak to you today on a subject that I like very much, uh, but I tackle from an e economist's perspective. Um, as was introduced, I'm uh, from the Lawton School of Economics. I started my career at McKinsey. I spent some time in Germany, saw some industrial parks in Germany, and um, then went to work in uh, many parts of Asia and the Middle East. Now I'm back in Switzerland. So the title of my talk um, is From Mostar to Duby. And for those of you who are not from the Zurich area, Duby stands for Dubendorf. And it means a physical place next to Zurich where there is a new um, innovation park planned. I'm going to talk about Mostar. And, I, and, and I'm going to talk about the Dubendorf park, at least what I can talk about uh, both projects, because there are a bit special circumstances in both. It's a timely um, opportunity to do so, because just yesterday, Swiss Parliament, one of the chambers, the Senate, has decided to move ahead with an innovation park strategy. And uh, I'm quite closely involved in that strategy, as I'm in the board of a new company that is uh, being set up in order to have different innovation parks in Switzerland. So just yesterday in Parliament, this has been decided. On the other hand, it's not very timely for me to be here because, uh, as you know, Switzerland is changing its energy policy. So we are actually very, very much involved in this change of energy policy. We have decided to exit from nuclear and reduce our fossil energies. And that's really taking a lot of our time as a business association, as you can imagine, right now. So what I'm going to uh, tell you is a bit of a personal story, frankly, because I have um, been involved in this area for quite some time. I was a partner at a, a project management firm called MaxMakers. MaxMakers is a Zurich firm that was set up in uh, 2003. Um, I was one of the partners who set it up, and MaxMakers was advising governments and investors on large and complex real estate and also infrastructure projects. So with MaxMakers, I had the pleasure to be able to work with the Iranian government, for example, on a satellite town near Tehran. We were in, involved in Iraq, involved in several Chinese eco-developments. We were involved in a satellite city in Korea. So I saw many different types of projects, and always from the economist's perspective. We were client representatives. We were doing the strategic and financial plans of these projects, and then we included um, spatial planners, we included architects, we included engineers into these projects on behalf of our clients. Uh, in 2005, um, I was in charge of the Middle East and we were involved in a few of these very ugly Dubai projects, as I may call them. Um, you know, two hotels, 2,000 apartments, everything has to be done in three years, no insulation, it's just about making quick bucks. And I really got disgusted with these projects, and I was looking very hard to, to find another project uh, in the Middle East. And I was lucky, because I, exactly at the right time, at the right place, I was in Abu Dhabi, mid-2005, when the government was starting to think about a new economic development strategy, and as such, a large eco-city project called Mazdar. When we were, we were involved... At the beginning, literally, we were given a report by McKinsey who stated that um, one day the oil and the gas would be running out in Abu Dhabi and that, therefore, a new strategy should be initiated and that new strategy should be based around energy, as one have, has already experienced in the fossil energy market, and should be based on renewable energies because that was seen as a large and growing market. So... That's how Mostar was started, and I, I, I was very privileged to be three years engaged by the government of Abu Dhabi as Max Makers. We had a team of three people, um, and it was a great experience because there was lots of budget, and we could really um, um, research very well and, and, and dig very deeply into this subject of eco-park developments. Then I was lucky again because after a very disappointing meeting with Google. I was for Abu Dhabi in America trying to convince Google to come to Abu Dhabi and start operations in this eco-city called Mazdar. Um, our then Minister of the Economy, now Minister of Energy and Environment, Doris Leuthardt, came to Abu Dhabi with an economic delegation. And on my way back from uh, Google in America to Abu Dhabi, I was preparing the speech and uh, I, I couldn't help the feeling to try to develop a little more than just tell 
uh, Madame Leuthardt about what's going on in Abu Dhabi. That's really what she wanted to know. The reason why I was thinking around these topics is that Google really gave me uh, the cold door, as you call it. They really listened very, very well and were extremely interested in what Mazda was all about. But then when I told them, hey, come on to Abu Dhabi and start you know, your business in Abu Dhabi in this great eco town, they said, uh, you must be crazy. We're not sending our programmers to the desert. We want them to be in Zurich or Palo Alto or places like that. Nobody of the talent scale that we are employing would go to Abu Dhabi. So it was a bit of a shock, and it also gave me a very important lesson. No matter how many billions you put into an eco-park development, the fundamentals of the project still need to be right. And if you try to get a high-value-added uh, person, such, a, uh, such as a Google potential employee, to a place like Abu Dhabi, your chances are not so great. That's why Google actually has their European head office in Zurich, which is very different from the desert in Abu Dhabi. The living standards are a lot better, and that's why Google has ch made that choice and not the Abu Dhabi one. When I spoke to Madame Leuthardt uh, in Abu Dhabi, I therefore told her about Mazdar, and then I said, but you know, really, what we should do is we should start including this idea of, of heavily focusing on, let's call it clean tech or the green economy out of Switzerland. Because in fact, when I was doing my research in Abu Dhabi, I always came back to Switzerland because uh, all the research that we were um, looking at showed us that Switzerland actually had an excellent international position, particularly compared to Abu Dhabi, with respect to sustainability or sustainable business. So the framework conditions of the government were much better. Energy was a lot pricier than it was in Abu Dhabi. Many other things were just better, more conducive to a project such as an eco-city. So this idea uh, she liked quite a bit, and, and she told me, you know, why don't you try and bring this subject to Switzerland? So I decided uh, in a month's time to set up a foundation, the Foundation for Global Sustainability, which is in Zurich. I reduced my pensum at the uh, Max Makers, and, and I'm now fully engaged in the subject of sustainability on a not-for-profit basis. So I'm not uh, working for money, but I'm working to try and make an impact. And that was uh, the first project with which we tried to make an impact was Abu Dhabi. And now you know Dubi is the place and Abu Dhabi is where the Abu comes from. So it's basically the idea of Mostar put to Dubendorf in Switzerland. That was our first project. But when we started to work on this project, it became very clear that we are now in Switzerland and no longer in Abu Dhabi. In Abu Dhabi, if you uh, wanted to you know, get another two million for another three months of uh, extensive research, you would have to have one good meeting with the sheikh, and then the sheikh would go yes or no. And then you had your two million or you did not. In Switzerland, this place where we wanted to build Abu Dhabi is now used by the military, um, and the military wasn't sure whether it wants to use it on a continuous basis. The government wasn't sure whether an innovation park was a good thing, so we started on a very, very different time scale. Instead of one meeting, yes or no, it it, was, it became very clear that it's a process that you know, takes time and, and is on a Swiss time scale, piece by piece. And also, when I went to Parliament for the first time to start to lobby for this project, with the military, for example, arguing that they should give us the land and you know, that's not really a great place for an airport, we should do an eco-park, um, it became clear that the Swiss political support for sustainability measures wasn't all that great sometimes. Particularly, the business community was quite skeptical towards anything to do with sustainability. So, some of the parliamentarians suggested to me, why don't you start an economic association so that you can lobby with the power of green business, because then those things, like the innovation park, could be moved through parliament a bit more quick. So, that's exactly what we've done. So, having the foundation, we set up an economic association called Swiss Clean Tech, and we're now representing sort of the Swiss voice of green business lobbying for sustainability in Parliament and trying to make sure that sustainability from a business perspective is not seen as a problem primarily but as an opportunity. That's the, 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 sort of the development that led me to today. Uh, as, a, as I stated, framework is key. So the biggest difference between Switzerland and Abu Dhabi was that Switzerland has a, had a regulatory framework that was conducive to a project such as an eco-city, whereas Abu Dhabi did not. And that's, um, that was a key um, uh, lesson learned from my 
three plus years in Abu Dhabi and also from comparing Abu Dhabi with Switzerland. Another key lesson is that in Switzerland there's a market let's, for sustainable things in business. So insulation, all these things are here and people are using it and therefore there's a market. In Abu Dhabi the problem always was that it was clear that there's no local market. It had to be developed. It was a front-front runner project while everything around the project wasn't sustainable yet. So there was no market for insulation, then there was no market for heat pumps, there was no market for solar panels because in fact the government was heavily subsidizing energy, was heavily subsidizing water, so nobody cared whether to say that or not. These were the two key um, sort of uh, understandings that we gained, apart from the fact that Switzerland ha is a great place to do a project like this, and I come to Switzerland in a second. I first want to give you a brief overview of how Mostar was. Now, I say how Mostar was because I want to make it clear that I'm not speaking for the government of Abu Dhabi anymore. Our mandate has been terminated three years, it, it was. Uh, that was three years ago, so I'm not even accurate anymore. Bafu asked me to talk about this project, which I'm delighted to do, that, but I want to make it very clear. It is my own personal opinion, not that of the project, not that of the Abu Dhabi government. So, how does this project look like? This was um, the first major drawing that was shown around. Um, you see it's a huge thing. It has, um, uh, it was, it's planned for 40,000 40, inhabitants, 50,000 commuters are expected. It has 6 million square meters of built up area and a budget of 22 billion US dollars. So this is big stuff. It's the government of Abu Dhabi behind it so far almost exclusively financing this project and very key, it's a government project, it's about economic differentiation. At least that's how it was when I was with it. I come to these differences in a second. And it had, you know, even though it was big, also big goals in terms of sustainability. As you see, it's supposed to run 100% on renewable energy, it's supposed to be carbon neutral and car free. Now for anyone who's been to the Middle East, Car-free and the Middle East, they don't really work together. These guys like to drive uh, to the bathroom with their car and uh, to imagine a place where you know, there's no cars at all in the city was quite a daring thing to conceive. It was only possible because of the most modern building technology, urban planning approach was applied in Mazdar and the best firms work together. We had the privilege to work with Arab, you know, Foster and Partners, really the top guys in, in this area that have lots of experience in sustainable uh, building and urban planning. At the core of this project is an eco-innovation park or a clean tech cluster as we call it. So the core of the project is actually um, an industrial development project in order to attract renewable energy firms and, and achieve this economic differentiation I was referring to. So that's, that, that was, that's the core of the project. And then there's mixed use stuff around it so that even at night it's not a deserted place. It has apartments, it has a university, it has, it has things like that. And also interesting, it had, it had, I must say, a Swiss hub. It was originally conceived to move the Swiss embassy to this project. So there's a bit of a Swiss element in the project as well. Unfortunately, that's not going that well. Um, if somebody is, is interested, I can sort of talk about that separately. Briefly, uh, no use to go into the chart, but Mostar really was conceived with the, in the right way. It had clear rules as to how the city should work together, and these, these, these uh, thinking, this thinking in cycles and, and to trying to combine and make the most out of the resources that you consume really was applied in Mostar. There were uh, rules on, 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 on material cycles, on water, electricity, cooling, heating, mobility, all these different things. One tried to combine together, and it's a greenfield site or a desert site, so you could really start from scratch with all and everything. For me, it was nice to kind of see this development when we started out. Um, the first thing was to try and identify where the project actually was because uh, the, 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 the map material wasn't that great in Abu Dhabi so the first thing was to define the project site and as you can see on the left it was just pure desert. It was also right next to the airport which was kind of interesting to us at the beginning because Eco Park and airport right next to it didn't really work out so well for us but that's where it was, we couldn't change that and in 2010 as you see from the satellite picture Mostar did develop, uh, there is quite a lot of activity going on, so it was nice for us to see how this project would be moving ahead. One of the biggest success 
elements of the project was missed. This is the Mosdar Institute of Science and Technology. So the government has managed to bring in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology to set up a university there where you actually get a degree that is a, a joint degree with MIT. So a very uh, important and prestigious thing to achieve in the Middle East. Also, it was nice to see that you know, we had the years of just these bloody drawings um, where you know, these visualizations are nothing real. And then after a while, you actually see, and this is a good picture because you, you actually see you know, how Foster conceived the building and the, the narrow alley, alleys and, and things like that. And you can actually see it uh, uh, becoming real now and for, for me quite a pleasing uh, thing. Very complex is the financial and strategic structure behind such a project. And, um, particularly if it's large and particularly if the government is involved and has some long-term macroeconomic goals but also wants to mobilize private sector investment, the structures become pretty complex. I don't have time to go into details, but basically you have to have a development company that basically caters to tenants because tenants don't want to deal with different entities. One of the big selling points of an eco park is that you can have a one-stop shop, register and get going where the rules are set out clearly. But because financing property and financing infrastructure are two very different things in terms of you know, whom you talk to in which bank, these were separated out in terms of uh, corporate structures so that you ha could have special purpose um, vehicles that were infrastructure based and that you could have property type activities where people could actually buy or lease a share of land. Quite complex when it comes to distribution of profits because as you can imagine, if you want to run the whole thing with renewable energy, for example, on the infrastructure side, these guys on the property side needs to know, need to know how much the energy is going to cost because their alternative is just to buy the energy in the market uh, where you know, it's subsidized gas and much, much lower in price than the renewable energy produced by the solar panels over on this side. So this has to be coordinated. Therefore, it's very, very complex at the, at the top to see where the profits go. Where do the private investors benefit and where does the government benefit in terms of macroeconomic benefits, in terms of long-term economic upside. Today, the project, this is a January, I don't have a recent one, um, a January uh, picture of about a billion and, and, and a half has been invested. The university is up and running. Um, unfortunately, however, there is little success with very large-scale companies moving there and actually being active. Even the students need to be kind of bought from abroad because it is the desert still. You're in, more or less on a construction site where this university is located on. So it's actually not a very easy sale, even though the government is behind it, even though there's quite a lot of money behind it as well. And obviously, the real estate crisis hasn't helped. That's the status today. And my personal conclusion on it is that, you know, no matter how big you go, no matter how much money you put in a project like this, if the fundamentals aren't really right, and particularly if the management isn't right, the project's doomed to fail. So that's how the idea came to move from, from Mosdar to Switzerland. So let's have a quick look on Switzerland where the I need to do that as the president of Swiss Cleantech, sell you Switzerland briefly on a sustainability scale. Before talking to sustainability, just briefly, we're in the country that is the richest country in the world. Just two days ago, a new survey came out. We have one of the highest uh, quality levels of quality of life here. We're very competitive. The World Economic Forum just named us the competitive, most competitive country in the world as well. We're top in innovation, uh, according to the European Innovation Scoreboard. We have a super image abroad, and we have a clean tech track in the sense that you know, we're world record holders in public transport, we consume a lot of bioagriculture, we have very tough rules on toxins, we have very high recycling rates, we have great building standards, and we also know about um, managing energy because of our hydro power. So we have an extremely good basis. And that's very, very different from Abu Dhabi, who has one of the highest ecological footprints in the world, by the way. Um, but it also means that Switzerland has to act differently and look differently at, at this subject. And first and most importantly, Switzerland is sort of at the top of its development now. So we, are, we have to, from an economic perspective, look into sustainability as a way to differentiate ourselves. We can't compete on price. Our prices here are sky high. We need to compete on innovation. And when we look at innovation and we look at our track, the innovation route towards clean tech towards the green economy is an obvious one. 
And therefore, uh, our association is heavily promoting that Switzerland is fully backing this course, fully engaging into a green economy strategy where we want to be a, a, a front runner in climate politics, a front runner in energy politics. And that's why it's so important today that you know, we're, we're moving away from fossil, moving away from nuclear, and really uh, move into a, an area of, of uh, uh, renewable energies. So that's what Swiss Clean Tech is doing. As I said, voice of the Swiss green economy. Um, we're, we're, we're lobbying. So I'm, I spend a lot of time in Parliament trying to really convince politicians to vote this way and not the other way. The trick with Swiss Clean Tech, if you want, is that we are representing not an NGO, not the WWF, but we're representing business, but we're re representing business who want sustainability. So in Parliament, we can make a difference with this voice. We can win politicians from the middle over to the left and green general votes, thereby gaining majority for sustainable regula regulation. And that's really key, and that's the trick of Swiss clean tech. We have done that for quite a while now. We started with CO2, where we were one of the parties most important to get the tough CO2 law implemented. And now energy is, of course, our biggest topic, where we are wholeheartedly supporting an exit from nuclear and an exit from fossil, different from almost other economic associations. We were, had a great help uh, by, uh, by the co-founder of Swiss Cleantech, Bertrand Picard, who is the originator of this project, you may know, the Solar Impulse project. And in a way, it's a little flying eco-park, in my view, because it has clear rules as well. It is, it is uh, 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 an airplane that flies solely on solar power. It has solar panels on its wings. It doesn't have kerosene in its wings inside, but it actually has batteries. So it can stay um, in the air with a person in the cockpit for 24 hours, even if the sun goes down, the batteries carry the plane uh, uh, until the sun rises again and new charging through the solar panel can begin. And this is really a symbol for Switzerland and it's also a symbol how with very specific rules and a lot of money you can achieve quite big things. Bertrand has broken four world records with this project and obviously it's a great symbol for what we've been doing. We started um, on the first day of the Copenhagen Climate Conference in December 2009 because we just thought the CO2 law in Switzerland isn't right. Given all our strength, we need to go further. And um, from then on, we got quite an impulse with this project and with our policies. This is how we are represented today. We have about 315 direct members and a lot of associations that we represent. And the common denominator among all these companies is clean tech. They're large and small, they're utility companies, they're engineering office, law firms, venture funds, all different types of businesses that we represent. And the common denominator is clean tech. And maybe most important, clean tech for us is not a quality factor, but it's uh, is not a industry, but it's a quality factor, so it applies to all industries. And really, it's the thinking of an eco park set on a country scale. Because Quite simply, we say, even from a business perspective, there's only one Earth. Therefore, we need clear regulatory frameworks to make sure the economy develops in a sustainable path. And that's really what Swiss Clean Tech is all about. That's our policies that we're trying to get through. The aim that sustainability is systematically rewarded in the market, so the new rules in order to move sustainability from the niche into the mainframe, into the, into the mainstream, so that sustainability is systematically rewarded. You make more money with a sustainable investment, not less. If you move to an eco park, that's exactly what we do, um, because it's exactly the same logic. You need a set of rules on the ecological and on the social side, and that's really what, in our view, an eco park is all about. Paul Rohn, a uh, uh, US economist, um, quite controversial, I don't subscribe to all his theories, but he kind of puts it quite interestingly, a village is too small, a country is too big, so let's start with a city, or you could, you could say an eco-park, to set some new rules and try some new things. And I think that's really the essence of, of what an eco-park is all about. There can be different nuances. If it's in Abu Dhabi, it's very different from when it's, when it's in Zurich. Now, the, the, to conclude and, 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 and give a bit of an outlook with the key lessons that I have pulled out of this experience in Mostar and also more and more in Switzerland on eco-parks, maybe a few factors, you can call them success factors. One is, it is extremely important 
what the objectives of the project are. So it's great, you know, if we say uh, there's public projects and there's private projects and there's PPPs. My experience is that often the, the, the objectives get, get, get mixed up. A government has macroeconomic objectives, an investor has microeconomic objectives. Sometimes they don't match. In terms of corporate structures, in terms of clear goals, it's extremely important that you set very, very clearly the objectives and therefore, and then specify your corporate structure accordingly, otherwise it's going to be a mess. And also, it's very important to specify what is economic value. Because currently economic value is me measured by GDP, and as many of you know, that's not an ideal way to measure wealth or happiness or many other things. So economic value also has to be defined. It's not enough to say, let's look at the economic value the project generates. Let's specify exactly what economic value in which time frame. Then the local market. I think it's an illusion to take a remote area and say, let's do an eco park. This area will get a boost. Um, and everybody's going to be happy. You have lots of mayors in the world and lots of heads of provincial governments who run around and say, we're going to do an eco-park here in this province and the world's going to change. The world's not going to change. Economic realities remain. You will not get investments into these places. And therefore, it's extremely important to find a place to do such a project where the local market is strong already, where there's business and research in place already, not in some far out remote location. And the location in terms of the uh, geographic area, but also specifically in terms of the local point where it is, has to be top. If you want to set new rules to the investors, you need to give them something in return. And usually it's cheap land and, and, and fast administrative processes and also top location that you can give them in return. So if you have a far out uh, location, in our view, that doesn't really do the trick. The size uh, is, in our view, not really important. As I mentioned, Solar Impulse, in a sense, is such a project with new rules. We have a, an, a project in the US where we try to build, uh, make a, a showcase green building out of the uh, embassy, the Swiss embassy in Washington. That also is a project where you have specific rules. It's an embassy. You don't need to go through the usual custom things to develop your, to, to, to deploy your heat pump and things like that. So, the size doesn't really matter so much. The location, the market's much, much more important. And the mix, in a sense, uh, is, 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 is also important. Depending on the size, you do the right mix. These are really real estate infrastructure development questions, separate from ecological topics. Also, sometimes I find there's a mix between, a mix up between the thematic focus and the development uh, strategy. So you can say uh, we do an eco park in the chemical industry and we develop it in an ecological way. Now, developing it in an ecological way means you do the buildings and, and, and the urban plan planning in, a, in, a, in, a, in an ecological way. The thematic focus could be you try to get businesses that work on eco products and, and clean tech and things like that. These are two different things. And it is sometimes a very good strategy to combine them, but one has to remember that they're actually different things. How to build the park and then what is in the park are different things that needs to be separated out. Another thing from Mosdar uh, that became very important, one needs to separate between the geographic unit and the economic unit. Sometimes if a project says, for example, we are 100% based on renewable energies, they think it all has to happen in this one place. But that does not necessarily make sense. Maybe it's a very dense urban environment that can be sustainable in the sense of um, insulation and things like that, or heat networks, but uh, has their wind turbines somewhere else in the North, North Sea where they don't bother anyone. So in our view, differentiation between the geographic unit and the economic unit that would include the, the wind park and the local uh, development park is also important. And maybe as a general conclusion to me, these projects, many of them, I find are very useful. But as a test case, as a demo case to attract foreign direct investment and things like that. But one really has to be careful that one does not stay in the frame of mind, if you want, where we have been in for the last 20 years. That we try to be sustainable in a few niche markets and we don't really care about the rest. At the end, it's the world who has to be an eco-park. 
At the end, we need to move sustainability in the mainstream. Only by doing this, we will reach our sustainability goals. And that's why, as an association right now, Swiss CleanTech is trying to do exactly this. We're trying to basically create an eco-park out of the whole of Switzerland to, to same objectives, run a test market on how to run a country in renewable energies, make a demo case for other countries to copy. That's really the aim. So as a picture to conclude, we have one world. We don't need to change it all. All we need is the regulatory framework, the rules, as we need in an eco park. We need it all over the world to make sure sustainability is rewarded in the market. Thanks very much.